Well, would y'all look at that? I can actually go live on my page. What a privilege. <laughs> it's Monday, 7.30ish, and we have got a study to dive into. Now, I will say that uh, if you're watching the replay, go ahead and say hashtag replay. And of course, if any of this content just blesses you and you think of somebody else who it will bless, go ahead and tag them in the comments below. So we have been going through the names of God together. Again, the book is by Anne Spangler. And it has been a great study. I will say I do not prep for these prior to the Monday, but instead I treat it like a time of of you and I digging in the word together. Meaning, I don't know everything about the word, right? I'm still studying, I'm learning, I'm digging, I'm loving. And so I come here, study with you, and then dive in thoroughly after. So I hope you are doing the same thing um, as I am. So tonight we are going to do um, Lord, the name of God, Yahweh. So the name Yahweh occurs more than 6,800 times in the Old Testament. It appears in every book but Esther, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs. As the sacred personal name of Israel's God, it was eventually spoken aloud only by priests worshiping in the Jerusalem temple. After the destruction of the temple in AD 70, the name was not pronounced at all. Adonai was substituted for Yahweh whenever it appeared in the biblical text. Because of this, the correct pronunciation of this name was eventually lost. English editions of the Bible usually translate Adonai as Lord and Yahweh as Lord. Yahweh is the name that is most closely linked to God's redeeming acts in the history of his chosen people. We know God because of what he has done. And when you pray to Yahweh, remember that he is the same God who draws near to save you from the tyranny of sin, just as he saved his people from, from tyrannical slavery in Egypt. I have to tell you real fast why I was drawn to this um, name Yahweh for this study. I think I told you guys, or maybe you don't know, but I was in the book of Philippians and I was doing a Philippians study and I was really loving and enjoying that. And in Philippians uh, 2, uh, 8 through 9, it says, I have my Bible here because it's actually not. I looked to see if it was part of the Yahweh study and like the passages for continued study and it wasn't. So I wanted to read it um, tonight. For it is, or excuse me, for it was only through this wonderful grace that we believed in him. Nothing we did could ever earn this salvation, for it was the gracious gift from God that brought us to Christ Jesus. This is not what I wanted to read at all. Okay, what I wanted to read, let me see if I can get there, was it was all about, I don't know why I wrote that one down. The, oh, I'm in Ephesians. I'm in Ephesians, friends. My fault. I apologize. So let's try Philippians 2, 8 through 9, which is actually what I meant and wanted to read. So that was Ephesians, which is a great book, but not what I wanted for tonight. All right, 2, 8 through 9. Here we go. So um, this is just about the example of Jesus Christ. And it says he existed. I'm going to start in 5, 6. The print is so small. What does that mean? Don't tell me. Don't tell me in the comments. He existed in the form of God, yet... He gave no thought to seizing equality with God as his supreme prize. Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself to the form of a lowly servant. He became human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. He was a perfect example even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. Remember the Lamb of God, which we already studied, yes? Because of that obedience, listen to this, because of that obedience, God exalted him and multiplied his greatness. He has now been given the greatest of all names. The authority of the name of Jesus causes every knee to bow in reverence. Everything and everyone will one day submit to this name in the heavenly realm, in the earthly realm, and in the demonic realm. And every tongue will proclaim in every language, Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh, bringing glory and honor to God 
his father. Now that was Philippians 2, 6 through, I read all the way through 11. But as I was reading it, I'm like, okay, because of that obedience, God exalted him and multiplied his greatness. And he has now been given the greatest of all names. When I read that, I thought, Lord, what what is the name that is the greatest of all names? Because if that is great to you, if that means that you're exalted in that name, if that is the highest honor and praise, then I want to call you by that name. I want to sing your praise to you in that name. Does that make sense? So for example, when my husband calls me Amber, I think something is odd or wrong or weird because he just never calls me Amber. It's not the greatest of all names when it comes to who he is in my life and how he's always called me, right? And so I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, Lord, if I have not been addressing you with the highest honor and the highest praise when you have done this and so much more for me, then I want to change that. I want to call you by the greatest of all names. And so I remember very distinctly being in that study of Philippians and just writing down in my journal, Yeshua, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yeshua, Yeshua, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yeshua, right? Because again, if we're not only understanding who God is and the names of God, but we're learning how great they are so that we can pray to him by name for how we want him to show up. So while I do not prep for uh, these studies together, like I said, I'm just kind of diving in with you each week and then doing further study after each one, I will obviously, I hope, dear Jesus, I would love that, right? If he gives me different downloads or divine uh, inspiration, they will flow through my mouth. That's only natural. And so here we see that when you pray to Yahweh, Remember that he is the same God who draws near to save you from the tyranny of sin, just as he saved his people from tyrannical slavery in Egypt. That's power. Yahweh, Yeshua. Yahweh, Yeshua. Yeshua, Yahweh. He did the greatest of all acts as the Lamb of God. And because of his obedience and because of what he did by putting on human skin, He was exalted and given the greatest name of all, Yahweh, Yeshua, Yahweh, the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the Lord Yahweh. So let's talk about God revealing his name in scripture. This is out of Exodus 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. 6 through 8 and 8 through 20. So let's dive in. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. I love that God caught his attention and then Moses had to act on that. He could have ignored it. He could have went out along with his business, but instead Moses followed the curiosity He continued with the question and walked over to see why. And in that, the Lord shows up. Let's keep going. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am 
has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt, and I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hevetites, and Jebusites, <laughs> a land flowing with milk and honey. And the elders of Israel will listen to you. And then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. And after that, he will let you go. Understanding the name. Afraid of profaning this covenant name of God, various rabbinical writers spoke of it as the name or the great and terrible name. Also, the un utterable name, the ineffable name, the holy name, and the distinguished name. All of those are in quotes. Notice that they are not actually saying Yahweh because they didn't believe that they could actually pronounce it and say it and do it honor and justice. And so they referred to Yahweh as those things, right? The name, the great and terrible name, the utterable name, the holy name, right? What I just read. Also known as the Oh boy, what is this word? Tetragrammaton, T-E-T-R-A-G-R-A-M-M-A-T-O-N. That's a new word for me, and I've been through human hermeneutics at a master's level. Trouble. Okay, so tetragrammaton, because it is formed by the four Hebrew consonants, capital Y, capital H, capital W, capital H. After this live, go scroll down on my page and see the image I posted about tonight's study. It is those four letters. And then it is like lightning. And then in the corner, it says, I am. That image spoke power to me. It spoke power to me all over it, which is why I posted it. All right. So uh, Hebrew consonants, the Y-H-W-H, it was first rendered Jehovah in the Middle Ages and enshrined as such in the King James Version of the Bible, such as in Exodus 6-3, Psalms 83-18, Isaiah 12-2, and Isaiah 26-4. This mispronunciation arose when in the 10th century, Jewish scholars began supplying vowels to Hebrew words, which had formerly been written without them. Since Adonai was always substituted for Yahweh, as scholars now think, in the biblical text, the Hebrew vows for Adonai were inserted into the four letters of the Tetragrammaton. I think that's how we say it. Unfortunately, the translation Lord, which is a title rather than a name, obscures the personal nature of this name for God. Though the meaning of Yahweh is disputed, the mysterious self-description in Exodus 3.14 is, I am who I am. It may convey the sense that not only that God is self-existent, but that he is always present with his people. Yahweh is not a God who is remote or aloof, but one who is always near, intervening in history on behalf of his people. If that doesn't speak power to you, read it again. Listen to it again. <laughs> The knowledge of God's proper name implies a covenant relationship. We are going to see this come up over and over again. We just learned about that last week, right? The God of covenant. 
And God's covenant name is closely associated with his saving acts in Exodus. The name Yahweh evokes images of God's saving power in the lives of his people. Now, I'm going to get into the questions, but this just reading this is reminding me of where I am studying currently. And I'm still doing a psalm a day, but I'm also in John. And what's so interesting is that as John was going through his ministry, John, as Jesus was going through his ministry on earth, right? He kept on making people a little upset. And one of the reasons why they were upset with him was because of what he claims. Listen to this in John 8, 14. The Pharisees, of course, are asking him in 13, you're just boasting about yourself. Since we only have your word on this, it makes your testimony invalid, right? They're like scoffing at him being the light of the world. And Jesus responds in verse 14, just because I am the one making these claims doesn't mean they're invalid. For I absolutely know who I am, where I've come from, and where I am going. You see, he referred to him as I am. And that was very upsetting for them because they did not see him as the Messiah. They did not believe he was the Messiah. And so for him to make such a claim of the most sacred name, it was very upsetting for the religious folk, right? And yet he kept telling them, you know the book, but you refuse to believe what's in it. You've studied so hard and you've memorized so long, but you don't even recognize what's in front of your face. So let's study the name a little further with some reflective questions, which I'll put in the comments. Number one, why do you think Moses asked God to reveal his name? Number two, make a list of everything God has revealed about himself in this passage. Again, that was Exodus 3, basically 1 through 20, but... They did one through three, six through eight, and 10 through 20. I just read the whole thing. Exodus three, one through 20. Number three, what does this passage reveal about what was in the heart of God in regard to his people? I hope you get so much revelation and comfort just from that one question. So I'm not going to fill it in for you because I have a lot of thoughts. Number four, what was the catalyst for God's action? Number five, why do you think Moses was afraid to look at God? Number six, Moses' reluctance is not hard to understand. Describe a time when you were similarly reluctant to do something you thought God was calling you to do. Okay, so again, reflect in the name Yahweh as you study what you know about him and then what you're gonna learn more about him in these passages for continued study, which I will put in the comments you guys have for reference later. Exodus 34, four through seven. Number six, 24 through 27. Deuteronomy 28, verses nine and 12. Psalms 32, verse 10. Psalms 34, verses four through five and verse 18. Psalm 37, verses 34 through 40. Psalm 103, the whole thing. Proverbs 3, 26. Matthew 1, 20 through 21. And John 8, 54 through 59. Oh my goodness. I hope you are digging in. Yes, I'm glad you're here watching them live or the replay on Monday evening or Tuesday morning. But honestly, while the lives are a good background and and some good history and obviously, you know, what she has to bring to the table, the reflection in the questions from your personal life and the continued passages that you can dive into in your own time as you ask Holy Spirit before you even open up your word, say, you are the teacher. Come teach me, Holy Spirit. Come teach me from your word. Invite him to do that and watch the pages come alive for you. Watch the verses jump out at you. Watch revelation and downloads come as you seek and search the scriptures. Because if you truly want to know more about this character and the names of God, do you not think he is going to show up for you and the desires of your heart? He can't wait to reveal himself to you. 
He can't wait. And while it may just be the tiny little tip of his pinky, I would much rather know of him and what he reveals in his tiny pinky than miss out on anything and everything that he wants to share and download and make revelation happen. So bless you, bless y'all. I'm pretty sure I, I said y'all would be able to vote. Maybe we should get back to that. But as I am just in the continued passages and then doing my own study, it has created this beautiful, just like pathway of each name that we conquer, um, you know, each week. And so I think it's been kind of a, a beautiful journey as well as a, a really good uh, segue or sequence. But there is obviously 52 names of God that we get to go through. So if there is one that is on your heart or just speak loudly to you, um, feel free to share that and maybe we can do that one sooner rather than later. So bless y'all. Have a beautiful week. Here's the hope in Facebook. Jell and I don't meet again for a long time, but guess what? I'm going to be quiet. There's a lot to wake up about, okay? So let's just keep on being the light and let's just keep on loving on people and let's just keep claiming the power of what he wants to give the church because he is revealing his name and who he is through his name so that people know who he is. Yahweh, the God who can do anything. God Almighty, the God of the impossible. The Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice forever. Final one. And the Lion and the tribe of Judah who is roaring fiercely and yet so much protection and love all over and all around you. Bless y'all.